wait, 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 wait. What? Hey! All right, well, what's up, everybody? It's uh, April Fools. I've been doing some yard work here at the house. I put some Miracle Grow on my head, and my hair just grew overnight. So I don't know what's going on here, but we're, oh, we're doing this live here, me and AR, and you're going to get to spend your April Fools with us. Hopefully, we don't act like fools tonight, <laughs> AR, at least too bad. But I, I shouldn't say that because I've already started the uh, the foolery here with this wig. But uh, I'm a my... fool every day. Every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fool. Everybody was wondering if this whole live was an April Fool's trick. <laughs> Surprise. Right. Right. Here we no, are. It's not. I no, it's not. I even brought my twin brother with me. Look at who joined me. My twin brother. <laughs> You're you better be watch it. You better watch it. You're within <laughs> arm's length there. Yeah. But no, welcome everybody to this live. Uh, we're excited. Uh, we've been talking about this since the last one was so successful and we had such a good time. I know a lot of you guys had a good time and just because it was, it was successful and we're just uh, feeling kind of giddy tonight, I'm doing some giveaways. Okay. So uh, what's going to happen is I got two different prizes. One will be you get to pick which Murder Metal Mayhem shirt you like. I'll hold them up. Got the original Murder Metal Mayhem shirts. And then we've got a zombie version of it um, with uh, the guys in the uh, podcast with me in a zombie motif there. So, so those are cool. So you get to pick which one you want. I've got uh, the zombie ones in large and extra large and the original just an extra large. And I'll send you a free die cut sticker, which these are super cool. Then the other prize will be one of my books. This is a novel I wrote called Deeper Than Dead. I'll sign it and it comes with a special bookmark just for the book. Uh, so that'll be the second prize. So the way you'll win this is you're going to wait until toward the end. I'm going to give you two different trivia questions and an email address you can enter. And if you enter by midnight tonight, that's central time. That's my time zone. Um, I'll do a random number generator and I'll pick the two winners and you'll get the prizes pretty quick. So that's uh, what we got in store. And we've got more than that, AR. We got a special guest coming on here. What did I'm you want to say you. about one of the coolest things is when you can reach out and build a bond with people like you and I have. And I reached out to one of my favorite people along with you that I watch every video he does. I really mentally see what he's projecting. I'm excited to have him join us here in a little while. He's right. going to be on a little later than we are, but he will be joining us. And that's unfiltered lucky. So nice. I worked hard to recruit him, but I'm a little disappointed because you don't have my size in those t-shirts. I know. And I was going to put in a thousand entries just to try to get myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am doing some new shirts uh, that will be coming up, and I'll make sure I get your size, AR, because uh, these are shirts we've had for a while, and and I was surprised. Always, whenever you order shirts, you always order the size that nobody seems to want. And they all want the size you don't have. So that's how it always is. Which is the Jen and I were talking about it. We we were thinking about doing some cool stuff like that too. But yeah, we were going to give away prison jumpsuit outfits with the convicts' thoughts on it. And then I yeah, I was going to say a t-shirt with the stripes, like a prison top. That would be really cool. <laughs> That would be awesome, dude. Shirt, but. Yeah, she wanted to do dog shirts, but I just wanted everybody to know what it was feeling like to wear a nice prison jumpsuit. <laughs> I'll, even, I'll sign it for everybody myself. There you go. There you go. That's funny. Maybe, That's funny. maybe, maybe possibly coming. <laughs> yeah, it's just like signing my bail papers all over again. Oh, you know? God. Like, so, uh, so what did you want to what you want to open this up with tonight, AR? We got uh, we're going to do some Idaho 4. I know that's what 
everybody wants to hear these days. And uh, we we're just kind of bouncing off some ideas. And uh, what did you? Uh, what do you think for the opening topic here? If you were to pick one. Well, you know what? Number one, I got to give you a big shout out. And what are your recent videos that you did in regards to PTSD helping an individual? Because I'm telling you, when I watched the actual footage of Brant Kapaka and the struggles he was having in that hotel hallway with law enforcement, I kept right. looking at my wife saying, how does nobody see it? How does nobody see this? And you know what, my friend? You did an interview that brought somebody else that's dealing with something very serious, and you, my friend, helped them. I yes. So, well, thank you, AR. I mean, I had, uh, you know, I wanted to do the Brent Kopaka story, but I didn't want to tell it like everybody else. You know, I'm a disabled vet, Army so I don't want to be disrespectful to a guy that, you know, was awarded the Purple Heart, um, regardless of what he may or may not have done after that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I got thinking about all the people I know, and one in particular that I interviewed, G.W. Ayers, he was my sergeant when I was at Fort Hood, Texas 30 years ago, and he suffers from it. He's retired now, and... Uh, He's just an amazing individual. He speaks on it. He counsels people. He runs an organization that helps homeless vets. He's an amazing individual, and he came across that way in the special. And we used clips from that. Me and Blogger Girl did some of the stuff in between the uh, dialogue with ARGW, and uh, it was one of our viewers saw it and contacted me and said he was a, a retired firefighter from Idaho, of all places. Um, and he retired to Arizona, and he's suffering tremendously from PTSD. He's even got some early dementia going on, and he needed some help. He didn't know where he could go as a civilian. So I went and did some digging and found a you know, few options around where he lived and gave him the name of one. And and the next day, he emailed me, said he made an appointment. He's going to be seen and going to hopefully get himself well, you know. And I just uh, so thankful, you know, that he reached out. That was one of the reasons I did it was not only to tell Brent's story, but to hopefully get people aware of PTSD. You don't have to be in the Army or the Marines to get PTSD. Here's a firefighter, Right. Um, people have PTSD that are not in the military, and I wanted to make that known, and I'm thankful that Tim, that's the guy's name, he gave me permission to use. I did a video that came out today, as you mentioned, that uh, I read the emails and show them on the screen so you guys can see what you know the back and forth was. And uh, I'm going to talk to him on the phone tomorrow, so we're going to talk and hopefully uh, you know keep tabs on him and see how he does. That's amazing. And, and, you know, one thing that I add just a little bit to that, because PTSD is very widespread and a lot of people don't understand coming out of the penitentiary, more people come out with PTSD than what is really recognized out there. And it's very hard to get the help or the direction to right. battle that entire scenario. I have it personally I just, I have a very good support system that helps me overcome a bad day with it. But I'm not, you know, it, it's hard to believe, but anybody that serves five years of worth of prison time straight in certain states, did you know when you came out, you're deemed disabled? You're wow. eligible for disability after you've served five years. Of course, it has to be on a higher you know, security yard and it has right. to be straight wow. because they deem that mentally it's just so hard to adjust and overcome what you've been through. And let me tell you, I served far more than five years numerous times. Right. So, right. Uh, when I got out, I had no help. I had no counseling. I didn't have anybody other than the small support system like my wife, but that's not big enough to really overcome PTSD. So I have a lot of special love for you for what you were attempting to do to help those out there. And that's what we as content creators are 
really trying to do. Right. And that's what I was trying to point out was, you know, too many times the content creators are getting these, and I don't get too many of them, but occasionally the whole, you know, you're just doing this for the clicks and the money and all this stuff. And, you know, I'd like to know, you know, what, what that person does for a job and if they would be willing to do it for nothing, you know, because, you know, we're doing a job and I don't see anything wrong with getting paid for your time. However, like you said, most of us have on other issues and other things we want to try to get across and maybe reach out and help some people in the process. And even if it's just for entertainment, I mean, if this helps a person after a shitty day at work, just kind of unwind and listen to us talk about this stuff, then great. You know, that saved them maybe from getting in an argument with their spouse or, you know, getting, getting a little bit, you know, too physical with one of their kids, you know, that, that, that's, that's great. You know, so these videos and this, these channels help for a variety of reasons, not just, you know, like a dramatic case, like this one with the viewer I was talking about. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you and I completely understand across the board cases like the Idaho Fork case, cases like the Delphi case. Cases even like the lost children of Sebastian Rogers, Summer Wells, and you know, a, a time ago that just seems to be cold. These are gut wrenching discussions, but they're right. discussions that need to be had. Open minds need to be had to look at the totality of everything going on. We don't right. get on here as content creators to try to disrespect anybody, that's no. definitely not my nature. And no, I wouldn't not be talking all. to you if it was your nature. Right. So, you know, I get how difficult the conversations are. And I think a great place to even start transitioning out of your great work is a question that one of both of our viewers has sent to both of us. If in the Idaho Ford case, we were to extract Brian Koberger completely out of the picture, who else would fall into that visionary of what could be involved in the case? Would it be the frat fraternity boys, the fraternity all together in its own self, not even just two singled out people, or would it be someone more in the Emma Bailey Demetrius realm? I kind of just give that over to you because I want to hear your opinion and I can't wait for lucky to join us. Cause I think it's a great question. Yeah. Take BK out of the picture. And what right. are your feelings of the Idaho Four? And my answer to that question is both. Um, I think that Emma and Demetrius were supplying substances to that campus, and those frats were deep in that kind of stuff from what I've heard. So I think that they're one in the same, basically. And I think if you want to know how it went down – read those 4chan posts because I've yet to see something in those posts that is not right. Now, those posts came out long before we knew about BK, and I read those posts, and I had a chill the first time I read it because it seemed very real to me. I don't know why, because any drunk person sitting at a computer could come up with some crazy story, but the details in in that in those posts are to me they've been accurate time and time again ethan's nickname loach's nickname the fact that david barracoa's dad was a, a involved with a professional cleaning service well think about it all the way down to the detail you could see in the girls windows from the room of the right fraternity. As soon as the lights that? went out, as soon as the how lights would, went out, they did it. How would you know that if you hadn't been in both places to know that? Right. And, and AR. Me, yeah. Sorry. I mean, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that he said in the uh, 4chan post said 19 minutes, including the walk back and forth. So that. Banfield body cam video starts at like 250 or a uh, yeah 253 or 250 somewhere in there right and it goes until 
like th uh, 320. Right. It's on for 23 minutes. I know that. And they say 19 minutes. And at 312, you see four people running across the band field heading to the Sigma Chi house. So to me, it started right after the last call to Jack D. I think they were hearing stuff downstairs. I think Xana and Ethan got it first. And they were frantically trying to call him, and he wasn't answering. And then on the last call, it went down. And 312, they're running back. And if you do the math, it's almost the exact time that that Banfield video is running. And that is extremely ironic that those cops are there at the exact time that this happened. And then right after it's over, they left and went to the infinity apartments. Yeah, I mean, I that, mean, I, I, that's just too coincidental to me to not have something to do with it. So to me, the answer is both. And I think that uh, drugs were definitely part of it. I think Ethan insulting Loach was a big part of this thing. I think Maddie insulting Loach. I think this was a culmination of many things, but I do think that the recurring, the biggest issue was drug slash money, and that's why I think Em and Demetrius are somehow part of it. But that's my hey, answer. You know, I I follow everything that you're saying, and I I have a lot of agreement to everything you're saying, but I even open up the spectrum more than just the frat house, Demetrius, Emma Bailey. You know, of course, we still project the 911 call and all of that into it with Dylan and Bethany and what could their involvement be, Quinn Kelly, what could his involvement be. There's so many players that right. if someone literally asked me, take Brian Coburger completely out of the mix, and what does that leave my thought process at the end of the day of what the culprits could be of this crime, and I say the entire community. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say the entire community is not because I feel like everybody in the community went into the house and committed the crime. It's not because I feel as though each and every single one of them played a part within the crime. Yes, I feel as though even before the crime, the community knew there was issues and stayed silent. I believe right after the crime, the community knew there were issues and knew what those issues were and stayed silent. Right. And then I think now where my biggest problem is, there are people that know things. They're keeping their mouth shut because they're afraid to stir the pot in their very local college town community that's going to reflect badly upon so many in that including law enforcement, including anybody that could be a part of the drug rings happening, not only locally, but from afar. This right. is going to affect so many people that now the best way to protect not only your family and your community, but others in other communities is to stay silent. And what that is doing is keeping the four individuals from getting the true justice they deserve. But on top of that, now they have a man sitting in a jail cell that I'm not saying doesn't know, or I, he may be another person that's got a ton of information about what happened. You never know. Right. But I think that he's not the only one at worst case scenario. He's not the only one that should be sitting where he's currently sitting. There are issues within this case that a lot of people are ignoring. And that's why I say the entire community. And it's sad. Um, it's sad that a community could do that. But yeah, yeah, it's super evil. Chat, super chat with a question. Uh, thank you so much, Modo, for your super chat. She wants to know, why would the university want possession of the house that was involved in a murder of its own students, though? A scam or to control the narrative? What do you guys think? So that's a good question. I mean, how, how do you feel about that with what the university taking ownership of that 1122 King Road? I'm going to allow you to give your opinion on what you think of the actual university's point of view of that. And then I want to tie that up at the end with the actual owners of the house that gave it to the university. Crazy sketchy with those two. Um, 
Yeah, I think the uh, the university wanted the house because they wanted it down. They were worried on parents' weekend, mom and dad thinking about sending you know Betty Sue to college. Drives by this house, like, oh wow, that's the house where those four people were butchered. Uh, we're not going here. Um, that's freaking me out. Um, so that's kind of what I think is just they wanted the memory of it gone. They want this thing swept as far under the rug as they possibly can. I think that's why they came up with Brian so quickly and and kind of just made him the fall guy. Uh, I don't think he was involved at all, honestly, but I'm willing to hear it, you know, if there's evidence, but I haven't heard it yet. So, uh, so yeah, I think they just, they wanted to control the narrative and yeah, thank you for that, uh, super sticker. That's super cool of you to do that. But that's my answer to that AR. I, I believe, you know, when, when the owners of that home, decided to gift that house because nobody just gifts houses. Nobody gifts properties. Right. That's all valuable. That's money, especially for individuals that are in the rental business. This is what they do. This is the company right. they have. They make money by doing this. But I believe, and I know this is okay. Here comes the April fool's day. Conspiracy theorist <laughs> AR Hayes is going to jump into that. I think they backpedaled. I think those owners realized, one, there's a big problem with that white Hyundai Elantra found in Oregon in pieces uh. as a getaway vehicle that matches the exact description of what the law enforcement gave as the vehicle they were looking for. Right. And then it all ties back. I mean, right. I, I guess, you know, people will say, no, it doesn't. I, I think it does. Through the research it does. Seen, it ties right back to not only 112 King, you know, home, but to those very owners. Right. Cause the woman worked for one of them right. and she so, owned the car and she lived in Colorado. I mean, just imagine the heat that these owners of that house are going to be under. You just have one of the worst violent crimes ever in the history of Idaho happen just right. outside of a college university, taking four young college lives and your car, which just miraculously gets passed around through employees or whoever it might be, ends up wrecked one state over <laughs> after the police have made a personal ploy to the community right. to find that very style and type of car. Right. Well, now now we got to clear our name. We got to get out of this. So I'm going to give up the property. I'm going right. to get the protection of the university by this because and they got rid of all their other properties there in Moscow. That's right. All of them, so they're gone. We're literally now we're backpedaling up and out of this. And to me, I'm sorry. That smells like knowledge or involvement. Right. You either know something, right? Or you had something happen that shows, and maybe that's why that house came down as quick as it did. Think oh, about yeah. the ownership in that gifting paperwork through their lawyers, most likely had a disclaimer. We're going to give all of this to you, but you have to tear the house down within X time frame. And right. it probably needs to happen before this goes to trial. Yeah. Because we don't want anything coming back to us on this property. We want it out. Right. That's called backpedaling. That's no. it. That's no, I hear you. And I think that that Elantra that you're talking about, I think that's the one you see on that mobile gas station, that goofy still, that's like a picture of the monitor. It's a shitty quality. But right. I think that's the car because that was 345. And that's the reason why law enforcement doesn't like to talk about that because uh, that doesn't jive with their time frame because that's leaving Moscow heading and toward Pullman. Right. Yeah. So at three forty-five jives with the time frame. I think this happened three to three thirty, or, you know, like 10 to three to about three twenty, maybe mm -hmm. that's when I think this happened. Um, but uh and that would make sense. And if they're trying to pin this on him, that's awfully convenient that that's, you know, leaving town at about the same time. I think that makes sense. Maybe they filled up with gas 
got some food and hit the road because it's a long drive. And the well, excuse she gave of why she just abandoned the cars, I don't even remember what it was, but it was some ridiculous right. nonsensical well, reason. Law enforcement said occupants, occupants of a vehicle of this description, if they right. you know, had that calling card and they were already on to one individual, and that's why they were so solid in their feeling that it was safe and sound, they would not have used the word occupants. I mean, right. I get how in our discussions, many of us are known to switch a word or two around in what we're trying to say, but they they already have everything they're going to say known and written and prepared for them. That word occupants was not a mistake. They were looking for occupants of that vehicle. And I believe you're right. I think it's the exact vehicle that ended up in Oregon. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's what happened. That's a great question though. It and is a I good think question. That, you know, a, a lot, uh, you know, with the ownership of that and the house coming down prior to trial, this absolutely ensures, and I'm not sure people fully understand this, if this trial ends up in a hung jury, mistrial, or an acquittal, they have no backup plan to go arrest anybody else. Yeah, I don't. Man, they're, <laughs> they put all the eggs in this basket. I think it's going to blow up on them, honestly. I don't know. I mean, unless they're going to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat, I really don't know what it is they got other than maybe we've talked about the whole, you know, co-defendant. If they've got somebody that claims, and I had somebody, you know, you're talking about Brent Kopaka earlier. I had somebody in the comments say, well, how do we even know Brent Kopaka is dead? Well, and that's, me, that's obviously a huge conspiracy theory. However... Wouldn't that be though. crazy if he was I, really alive and he's the one that's going to say I, that he did it with beat with Brian, that would be messed yeah. up. I've seen it happen where they wow. said somebody in a case I was involved in, I wasn't the major perp or the main guy they were trying to get, but I remember many of us were being brought in on charges and the main witness turned out to be a guy they stated was a part of our group that got swatted and he never died. He was alive the entire wow. time, but he was hidden in the background until trial and came out and testified. Thankfully not against me, but he testified against some of the major players in the case and everybody was in shock because they did a funeral. They did a full out service oh for the God. guy. They did everything wow. you could imagine. Except wow. for release body cam footage and stuff of that nature. And they say, they knew there he was. There he was. Wow. And we're in shock. Like, right? really? Really? So that's, and yeah, that's, that's not out of the realm of possibility. No, because, wow. I mean, if you really think about it, have we seen, I know we've seen Kopaka's friend come out and, and speak, and that's great. Right. But that could all be staged. That could all very well be staged. Where's the right. family and really the support of the community coming out speaking on that man's behalf or even people coming out speaking in regards to the PTSD and the ailments he was going through to fight for better, you know, uh, health care and stuff for that. Nobody's doing that. It's just shoveled underneath the dirt. And when right. they keep saying there's an informant out there that people are trying to talk to and the FBI is pushing them away. Boy, would that make sense? If, wow. <laughs> I mean, you don't you don't see him get shot. You don't see a body. No. You don't see no. anything. I mean, people Heck, have I said that about the Idaho 4 victims and we've never seen any video of them being taken out of there in bag in body bags, you know. Well, but, now you know, I did they could have, have done it if they built a tent around it and something like that. You well, know, I, I did have somebody reached out to me that was actually local from the area. And what they stated yeah. happened in regards to that is they blocked the entire area around the home up to like a block away, brought in ambulances late at night and removed the bodies. But I'm telling you, there would be footage of those ambulances driving out of the area. So I can't even really agree that that's the way that they removed the bodies out of the Idaho 4 home 
because yeah. it would be video. There would have been cameras on that area at all times, especially if you do roadblocks like that. People are going to know what's going on. Right. We're not all idiots. We're not all idiots. <laughs> I might be one, but we're not all idiots. You know, somebody would have caught it and they would have had photos, video, yeah. something. Now, I seem to recall right after this happened, and I've been trying to find pictures of it, and I can't. I'm not the best web sleuth out there, um, but I haven't been able to find pictures of, I recall a heating and air conditioning company being there like the next day. Yep. Now, when I search for pictures of this, I see a disaster, like a, you know, disaster restoration type place, but that's probably to clean up the, you know, the blood and all that kind of stuff. They're and not they gonna actually be, got I, sent on their way. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Because they came right. in, they were supposedly ready to start cleaning and they got sent on their way. But I do remember the air duct people that were supposedly right. coming in and that's where everybody started discussing there was possible video cameras in the air ducts. Right. That's what I was going to say is that seems very suspicious. So why are you taking all these air ducts out of this house? Um, you know, I mean, it's just it just seemed weird. And right after this happened, and I wondered if that door being propped open was maybe for the smell um, that would be in that house. And I wondered if somehow or another this air can, this air ducting had something to do with the video surveillance. Cause I've done video, a video on that. I do think, you know, these owners were incredibly sketchy. Uh, I wouldn't put it past them to have that place wired up for video. Um, it's, it's wow. definitely something that I think is a, a distinct possibility. You know, and if we want to throw a monkey wrench into the entire thing, think about mainstream media pointing at Brian Koberger as the man that set up cameras in that young lady's apartment after she had been robbed and asked him to come set that up. Could Brian Koberger's actual tie to this be that he was called over when the locks were having to be changed, Xander's father, and they requested some sort of audio or video recording type system to be put into the home. And maybe, just maybe, and I know it's never really been talked about, could Brian Koberger have been someone that assisted in that? I, I have something similar to that. I was talking about in the same episode I did on the video surveillance that how do we know you know, again, I mean, we're just spitballing. We don't really know. You know, we're just throwing right. out ideas. But along the lines of what you're saying is maybe he was hired by the owners uh, to wire up the place to protect what was inside. Um, right. You know, to me, if this house was a known house that, you know, we've all heard about it repeatedly from a million different sources, was what it was going on there. And I honestly think that the fact that four of the six of them or five of the six of them have extensive family histories of narcotics and trafficking and prison. I mean, this is, to me, it's almost too weird. We talked about this, I think, last time. It almost seems like a setup of them all being in this house. But that would also make sense that this place is wired up for sound and video and I think you pointed this out repeatedly on videos I've seen. Hunter Johnson is like a permanent fixture in that place. And I think he was the liaison, but maybe I'm not using the right word, between the frat and that house. He's mm -hmm. always there. And when those cops showed up in the back, when Kaylee came out and that Rosendahl took her picture of her license, that incident, he comes out of the house and he sits on that couch. As now, if he belonged in that situation. Right. Like normally, like home. you would be as a kid, you see cops, you're like, I want to be anywhere but there. Right. Yep. But no, he comes right out, doesn't say a word, just sits there and listens, probably making sure. So I think he's there to protect the frat interest in what's going on in that house. 
He's just there way too damn much. He was there when the cops showed up when nobody that, according to them, that lived there was there. He was there at the door. Right. He's constantly there. So I don't know. I mean, it just seems like he had to have some, and he's the first one they called. Why is he the first one they call? They don't call a boyfriend or something. They call him. So I think he's got a, a higher purpose there than just, you know, hanging out and partying. Definitely so many questions in this case, for sure. And speaking of questions, I did have a couple uh, that I saw popping up that I wanted y'all to answer. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from uh, Wolf Angel. Why did Kaylee get out of there only to turn the night uh, that night to be unalived? What are your guys' thoughts? So I'll kind of jump in here real quick and, and yeah. throw my two cents in because I know you probably need a little break. You've done such a great job of explaining it. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and this is another oddity about this case is you literally have a victim. Well, you got two victims that most likely should not have been known to have been at the house anyway, even though Ethan's dating a young lady in the house. So you could suspect that. But it's been stated Kaylee had left, even with an uncomfortable type feeling, to the point that she was sketchy about coming back. And the only reason why she did is because obviously she was invited back to be a plus one. But I think even more so, she came back to see Maddie before her trip to Texas where, you know, here's my new car. I'm out of here. I'm sorry. I'm leaving. So... This is another complete scenario where we all scratch our head and say, how do these weird, unique circumstances happen? How do they play out like this? You have a victim completely out of the situation that somehow gets called back into the situation. Right. And to me, the only way that's capable of being done is the plan was directly placed. And people are going to hate my view on this. The plan was directly placed through Dylan because she's the only one that could have made that phone call, that request for that and one to get somebody back in the house oh, yeah. that very time. Nobody yeah. else made that call. Maddie didn't even make that call. Right. Dylan did. So where's the explanation of why, Dylan? Why did you need Kaylee to be your and one when you had Bethany right there? You had Maddie right there. You had Xana right there. You had Emma right there. You had Ashley Couch right there. You had all your buddies that right. you're living right there. But you yeah, and Ashlyn was at the house on Friday for that party they had there. So... I don't understand why she was, what plus one party was she going to when there was a party at their own house on Friday? I don't know. And, and why would you call the one person that wasn't at the house anymore? Right. The one person out of the house is the one that you called and requested. Yeah. And her mom said she me, didn't want to go. Her mom said she didn't want to go. Somebody come out and show me that Dylan and Kaylee were friends. Anybody yeah. come out and show me. Right. Somebody showed me another time they went out on a plus one to a movie or out to lunch. Anybody show it. I'd love to see it because right. I don't think it was. And that's why I feel that was an engagement. That was a set. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, SRB wants to know, is uh, Brent's case investigation still open? Do either of you know? Uh, I believe they closed, Frank. Yeah, well, I believe it's closed. <laughs> It's it's Are closed, you know, but you know. but they're not giving up the nine one one call. Um, that interview that those cops did after that was over was like, like some Twilight Zone stuff going on there with that. That was some weird responses he gave. So I don't know who trains those uh, police chiefs in those two towns on how to do a press conference, but they fail miserably because they look, it makes it worse. They'd be better off saying we're not answering questions and slam the door than to get up there and make a mockery of the whole thing. Pete, that's an absolutely excellent. And I was going to actually ask your opinion of that. I believe 
with the inexperience it showed it really really showed and i think their lack of actually just stepping to that podium and saying we're not going to be answering any questions today we're going to give you the little bit of feedback that we have the knowledge that we have we're going to share a piece of that with you but we're not taking any questions right that would have actually showed me more right that they were capable of investigating this case than them getting up there and making the statements and answering the questions the way they did i think you're absolutely right they made a mockery of themselves but they also deflated people's confidence in that they are capable of even running this investigation. Right. And even at the state level, which is frightening, is that Detective Tolleson, I mean, that guy is alleged to have done some really, really nasty stuff in that Donner's Ferry case with Dr. Moore and that uh, murder of that other chiropractor and how that guy's front and center from the Idaho State Police on the Idaho 4 case is beyond me. And then you throw him in there with a two-year, in essence, rookie uh, cop from the Moscow Police Department in pain. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Those two, uh, definitely uh, some weirdness there because Payne's dad owns or owned a uh, butcher or some sort of meat processing plant in Donner's Ferry. So it's very likely that those two have had some kind of history. They know each other. Yeah. I, I, I'm just baffled by all the coincidences that keep piling up that so many are willing to look the other way from and say they don't matter whatsoever. I, they do matter. And, and yeah. every single one of them, when you start, it's like writing a book. Each chapter that you put together makes the other chapters make sense. Mm -hmm. The problem is in this book of the Idaho 4, none of the chapters are following suit, so nothing makes sense. But when you look at all the coincidences, you start building a question in regards, was the investigation even handled properly? Was right. it legitimately inexperienced? Or was it overlooking evidence in this case? Was it burying certain things like the sticker gate type situation right. where you know you've got the body cam footage, you know you have it. I know. But you keep claiming you don't. And then right. at the very right. end, when, you're, when your butt's on the line, you find it. Right. Well, what are we going to have happen in this case? What are you going to find at the very last minute to save your butt? Because right. I know... We're awaiting all of this stuff as evidence to come back, and it's not coming back the way they said it was going to, and nobody's questioning, why is the evidence not coming back like you say it's going to? Right. You can only say gag order so many times or sealed and redacted before you start to question, do you really have it or not? Do you have right. it or not? You know, and the man. first two cops that showed up from Moscow were the two cops you were just talking about in Stickergate. Those that's, are the two. That's why there's that uh, that giggly. What's that called? That Brady that giggly Brady, yeah. Because and, of that. Yep. And that the prosecution's <laughs> got to battle that right off the beginning and say, right. "Okay, we got a problem right off the jump." Yeah, we better I mean, get are you kidding me? Here. Are you uh, absolutely so, kidding me that that they can't, they couldn't have found anybody else to respond to that that wasn't in some sort of mired in some sort of controversy or incredibly inexperienced. And I saw an interview with a, with a, a detective that said when he was doing that job, if there was a homicide, he had to be on site showered with a Tyvek on in an hour. Yeah. Why did it take Brett Payne four hours to get there? Was yeah. he like at a, at a family picnic and didn't want to, you know, cut loose? I mean, that's the most absurd thing. I mean, four hours. So, you talk you about the that, buttons, you talk about the DNA, and I don't know if we want to get into this tonight or what, but the DNA on metal, I just did an interview with an Australian police officer for a true crime deep cuts I'm working on. And he said, kind of echoed what we've talked about before, about it doesn't last long on brass. He said DNA doesn't last long on any kind of slick surface like that or, you know, smooth surface, it's better with grooves where it can, you know, get dug in. It's too easily 
you know, diminished and brushed off and it's, it's skin cells. But the, uh, the fact that that sheath, if there's, even if you go with their absurd timeline of four to four twenty five, by the time he gets there, that's 12 hours. It's been on there. And that's if it was left right when they left. So you've got a minimum of 12 hours in that one study that's been done. They used fish DNA, not human DNA, but it was like three hours max and that stuff's gone. So how are you telling me that's not planted evidence? I mean, it, it doesn't even make any logical sense that it would be there 12 hours later on brass guys everybody guess who's here oh, now another big uh, man with us. oh man there goes the neighborhood we got lucky yeah. here. what are we talking what? about in here We're talking, talking about, about you before. yeah <laughs> and since you just joined you get to answer the next question everybody ah, wants to know welcome informant welcome. informant question mark anybody have an answer for that one lucky or, first of all it's good to see you my friend good to see you Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. Uh, you guys are talking about an informant. Yeah, we well, now we are. About it. Now we are. <laughs> this is my wife, by the way, Lucky. I'm sure you've seen her before, but she's directing the ship somehow. <laughs> that's, perfect. that's perfect. Jean said I was the boss instead of yeah, doing a See how that goes, Lucky? <laughs> hey, you know, that's how it works. So, so what are we talking in there, about? My man. How, how do you feel about an informant within the Idaho four? What, what's your gut feeling telling you, my man? I, I think there's an informant. I think, I think there's, in my opinion, there is definitely an informant. I do you think, think directly involved, like very knowledgeable, or do you think it's an outsider that caught wind and maybe just sharing some of the things they've heard? No, I think it's someone involved. I think it's someone who was either there or someone who was actually involved. I, I mean, I feel like there was an informant because just the way that the whole investigation was set up, you know, when you think about it, they really haven't even explained how they zeroed in on Brian Koberger still. Right. That still hasn't been answered. Yeah, that's ridiculous. How do you even file charges against somebody without being able to tell? how you establish them as the suspect. I mean, it's like it, to me, that's the most ridiculous thing that that's not still known. Lucky well, that, that it's, that's it's crazy. Months. It's been 15 months already right. since, since Brian Koberger was arrested. And, you know, the defense is still asking for clarification about what led law enforcement to him. Right. I even, I, you know, I personally, inside of me, coming from the background I do, which obviously I committed a lot of crimes. And so I had to go through the whole building of the case and how we were going to attack defending it. But you know what? Even in a scenario like this, people throw out gag order, gag order, gag order, redacted. Right. Leaks build cases to the point that make them more understandable. And the number one thing that I feel as though could have easily been leaked was just a simple connection. Just a simple I'm connection. On real quick. How do you connect Brian Koberger to the Idaho four case? And what did investigators All right. find that triggered them to follow that? If that makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't you just leak what the connection and how you got Brian Koberger mixed up with the four people? There, there has to be some. Has to be. You know, if you think about it, and actually I, I, I was putting together a video last night about this exact thing. Because if you really think about the process of, of how they arrested Brian Koberger, it's really strange. You know, it's really strange that they didn't just pick him up and pull him in. You know, right, I, right. I mean, I looked it up and the Moscow Police Department is only 16 minutes from where Brian Koberger lives. Right. So it just right. seems weird that you would let him travel across the country right. and, you know, with possible evidence and who knows what else. And then what I don't understand is people keep saying, well, there, you know, law enforcement was hoping he would lead them to 
the weapon in Pennsylvania. And I'm thinking, well, how did the weapon get to Pennsylvania? Right. You would think Idaho, there's all kinds of places you could have stashed a weapon. You wouldn't have to drive to Pennsylvania with it. I mean, that's. Well, and he's, and why would you take your dad along? Right. You know, if you were going to be dumping right. evidence, it just seems. Hey, dad, odd. don't throw that bag away in the back yeah. seat. Just, yeah. just leave that alone, dad. I mean, that's. It, it's it's don't look at the shovel. Leave the shovel <laughs> yeah. alone, dad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I just, I don't understand why they didn't just pick him up in Pullman when they discovered his car. Because they discovered his car at the end of November. Right. So why did they follow him around for a full month? You know, I, I just don't understand why they would follow him around for a full month if they didn't even know for sure that that was his DNA on the knife sheath. Right. Do you, do you feel as though they were surveilling him in Pullman that entire time? After they figured out the car situation, do you think they were actually tailing him and surveilling him? I, I don't know. You know, the, the 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 two times that he was pulled over seems kind of strange to me, you know, on the way to, or you, oh, you mean in Pullman, Washington? Yeah, I mean, just around yeah. the area. Of the crime. Yeah, I think they you were do? watching him. I think they were watching him since the end of November. Hmm. And that's and why they, I, they couldn't have pulled him in and done anything. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Just I, I don't know. You know, why not? Why not? Why not just pull him in and question him? Right. You know, it, well, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. People say, well, you know, they they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to, you know, let him know that they were on to him. And I'm like, well, that's not usually how it works. You know, if they're right. on to somebody, they don't just usually follow you around for a month. Right. right. Personally, I think he was on the radar before this even happened. Um, I hate to say this and be too conspiratorial, but I did a video on the Pullman PD. I mean, you want to talk about sketchy. I mean, they're just as bad as Moscow, even worse. Right. And I think personally, when he interviewed for them, uh, which was the summer before uh, this happened, um, he was a you know cloud-based forensics guy, and this is a department with so many underhanded. I mean, they've been charged. I mean, there's been people fired. I mean, this is like legit. And right. this is, I think that when he went in there and started talking about all these investigations he could do with the computer and this and that, I think they thought, you know what, <laughs> I don't want this guy anywhere near our little right. skeletons in the closet. Get him the hell out of here. And I think maybe in the interview it came up that he likes to drive around at night because he doesn't sleep well and maybe that he lives by himself and he checks all the boxes and he's not from there. And to right. me, when the University of Idaho is throwing their temper tantrum in these two-a-day meetings, they sat in with the police as this investigation was starting. And they needed to come up with somebody. I mean, these two Pullman and Moscow were hand in glove. Oh, I yeah. think I think that's how he got involved in it. I hate to be like that. I've said this so many times. I'm tired of saying it, but I'm not anti-police. But my gosh, I mean this these this entire place. I mean, I've said this in videos here recently. Is like a cross between the Twilight Zone, Children of the Corn and the Sopranos. Yeah. That's well, that's what this place is like. This is insane. You know, absolutely insane. That, for a place that has no crime, there's a lot going on in Moscow, Idaho, you know, right. for a place that has no crime. I mean, they're like right. a very safe place, but Oh yeah. I, I don't it doesn't sound that safe. No, people well, drowning in 2 inches of water. Right. Yeah, you know, so just if you do everything in accident, then you don't have a lot of crime. <laughs> exactly. all I, I don't know why OSHA I don't know why OSHA's not out there for Christ's sake. If they get so many accidents, I would think that would be like a legitimate like a safety audit. You guys have all these accidents, you know. It's crazy. But if you think about it, you know, what are the chances that this suspect is earning a PhD in criminology, you right, know, yeah. and, and it just seems odd. Cause you know, I've heard people say, well, he, he studied criminology, so he would know how to commit these crimes. And I don't think they understand that criminology is not teaching you how to commit crimes. You know, it's, 
it's like statistics and research and data collection and stuff like that. Yeah. So I mean, I if you know. want someone to teach you how to commit a crime, I'll show you how to not hey, do it. It's knowledge you can't get in college, right? You know, that's, that's right. Like, you just get you watch that guy's channel college. too. Who's I that? It's one of those prison is in another ex con that does a channel, but he always says that that's oh, not knowledge you'll get in college. Okay, he's yeah, great. Probably. Yeah, you know, no, he's and, a Hispanic and, dude. I, I I love his. Yeah, channel. It, it's Pablo Pete or something like that. He's a that guy sounds dude, right. By the way, it's a great yeah, channel. It, it is, is. Great. He's comical out. with it. Right, he's yeah. very comical and he delivers it <laughs> so well. Big fan yeah. of his. I really am. But you know, when I knew there was actually going to be a problem, is when I saw the post on Facebook, and I think it came from 4chan or one of those places that said, I'm hiding out in the Poconos. And it's, you know, criminals, we're pretty dumb 98% of the time. We're, we're pretty good at giving our own selves up, even when we're trying not to. We right. leave little breadcrumbs that come straight to us. But I'm not in the belief that a quadruple homicide person that's committed his crime in Idaho is going to tell you he's hiding in the mountains in Pennsylvania. To Where's me, what that is, there's right. your informant. There is your informant. That very person that made that comment just gave up Brian Koberger, or maybe didn't even give him up, but gave up to the public like us where you're going to find the person they're going to arrest. And where was and that comment? Before. Where was that comment? Did you say AR? I believe it was 4chan. It was I one of the 4chan. It was all over at the very beginning before they right before, right before they arrested Brian Koberger. It was oh, everywhere wow. on Facebook and everywhere. And I remember stopping right there because I had a Facebook group and I was heavy discussion with a lot of people because yeah. everybody thought Papa Rogers. Well, that's Brian Koberger. You know, they didn't know Brian Koberger, but they definitely thought that was the man who was involved. Then well, it was all yeah. this swirling stuff, and it just hit me. The kid is – when they arrested Brian Cobra, and I looked at it, and I could just tell that kid's not going to tell on himself. Right. That kid is not going to tell you where to find him. He's well, I mean, not going to do it. He's, but then he's, again, he's he wasn't right. hiding in, in – yeah. He wasn't hiding for any reason. Brian no. Cobra was never in hiding. No, He's the only he one that stayed in town. He's the right. only one that stayed in town. The entire population scattered to the winds, left the country and all other shenanigans. And this dude's just <laughs> hanging out doing his thing, you know, going to school, going driving, to, driving yeah. around in that car, you know? right? That's going grocery shopping the next day. And that's what I didn't understand is they yeah. had already found the car at his apartment. And it just seemed right. as that why not pull the DNA off of that? Right. You know, or, or his apartment DNA out of his garbage at, at right, I, or is it a door handle? I mean, there's a bunch of ways they could have oh, gone. Yeah. Well, guys, I I just I still can't get over because I've been around the block once or twice. They have a 72 hour detainer hold that they right. can bring anybody that they want in and talk to you, investigate you, put you in a cell. If you say I don't want to talk to you, I want a lawyer. They say okay. Sit your butt in that cell for the next three days. Right. We're doing our investigation. We're going to pull in witnesses. We're going to talk to people. You know they could do that up to 10 times. They have 10 times they're allowed to do that. Wow. So you figure three days times 10 times, A that's month. 30 days they get to talk to you. Now, they can't do them all back to back to back. They got to right. spread it out a little bit. But hell, I would do that before I'd let my suspect drive all the way to Pennsylvania. Right. Come on in well, here yeah. for three yeah. days. We need to chat real quick. Come here. Right. You well, what's in, then, what, what was in Pennsylvania for them? You know, that's why did they follow him all the way to Pennsylvania? He he had been at, you know, the Washington State University campus from the times that the crimes occurred until they followed him. Mm -hmm. So what would have really been in Pennsylvania for them? You know, to follow well, they him were that looking, way. They were looking for a shower curtain. 
<laughs> they needed yeah. his shower curtain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I still don't get the whole Pennsylvania thing. It just doesn't even make any sense. But I've heard the DA over there has got all short, sorts of shadiness going on with him. So I can't remember what exactly it was, but I remember watching something and going, "My gosh!" Like I, I can't even, I can't even deal with the Idaho stuff, let alone going to Pennsylvania. But there's right. some because he was the guy that said he was going through the trash with his gloves and all this stuff there's been no evidence of that that's oh, just right. what he said he was doing so we don't really even know if he was doing I'd any of that still, stuff. i mean i hate to say this because here comes the tinfoil hat again guys the conspiracy's coming out but i feel as though they were trying to let coberger go back to pennsylvania so they could tie him to the pennsylvania murders that happened that's because they pulled the grand jury right after that brought his parents in I think they were trying to tie all that shit together with the Idaho. That's, That's where you you build the serial killer narrative right then and there if they can prove that, and it all fell apart on them. It all yeah. fell apart. I, I don't. This, I I feel like this whole thing is falling apart. I I feel like it just seems so odd. Like I feel there's a reason why they had you know the state police in Pennsylvania pick him up. I don't know what that reason would be, but I feel like there's a reason they let him go. If any of us, if any of us were a suspect in this crime, they would have not let us drive 2,500 miles across country. Right. We would have gotten picked it, up and questioned right there. I'm telling you, if I was a suspect, if they even just thought my name was at all involved, and I know, look, I get it because people would say your, your backgrounds are totally different. You know, my background compared to a PhD student, blah, blah, blah. My tattoos make me stand out. Right. But look, you have to set all that aside. I know my luck through life when I was even breaking into the idea of committing crimes, they didn't hesitate to come pick my butt up. No. If they thought I was involved, they came and got me. Yeah. And then they tried to turn you know. me, you know. Yeah, that's how it goes. I mean, that's. In what situation do they, you know, are they looking all over for your car and then they find your car and then they just follow you around for a month? Right. I, I just, I, I never understood that. And that's, that's one of the big reasons I, I mean, it, it would have had to be, if there is an informant, I feel like it has to be somebody with some pretty strong evidence because they've hung their hat on, you know, on this information, it, they, they basically, it's just such an odd way that they went about investigating this case. You know, it's just, it, it's strange. I, it you is know, strange. I almost feel if, if it's somebody like you feel lucky that was there or had interaction, that's a witness. That's not an informant. Right. Because I, I could also be a co-defendant. What they saw, what they know. That's somebody that's going to be cross-examined. So I understand you got to protect that, but witnesses are very well protected. They really are. Yeah. An informant's not going to testify. So they don't so much hide the informant. They just remove the informant from the situation by never releasing a name or the info that they got. This one is odd because it's being leaked that they have an informant. And that's why I go back. You kind of missed the beginning where, you know, we were talking about if we remove Brian Koberger from the situation, who else could be, you know, a part of this whole thing? And I said the entirety of the community, because yeah. of the fact of the silence and the hiding and the ability to just allow the cover up to transpire, no matter who committed this crime, they're allowing this to stay quiet. Right. And I believe there's people, and that's why they had to make that statement. If any of this is unsealed, the person that this is deemed to be a part of is at risk. Right. Whether it be law enforcement, whoever it might be, they're at risk, which tells me people know who that person is. They already know who it is. I think this community knows. I, You know, that's what's so strange to me is that nobody in this community is talking. You know, yeah. how do you get that many people it is not weird. to say anything? You know, how do you get that many people? They're scared to death. That's why. 
that it, it, usually that's the case, you know, they you saw what happened here. to those four and they didn't want any part of that. I mean, that's the only thing that makes any sense. I mean, how do you not have somebody? I mean, that town was there 20,000 people there. There's yeah. not one person that's going to go to, you know, CBS news and say, I want to, I can't sleep at night over this. This is horrible. I'm going to tell you what happened. Right. Well, I, I can't I believe it. Or nobody's posted anything. That's what surprises me. Even any, you know, just anything on, you know, any platform. Nobody's posted anything at all. You know how much strange. Think of the money somebody could garner for an interview about oh. anything about this case. Anything right. about the community, anything about Brian Kohlberger, anything about Madison, anybody a part of this case, especially right. Dylan. Or Bethany, if yeah, you right. got some inside information on Dylan or Bethany, and you're willing to come to the table, you're getting paid. Hey, yeah, or, or Dylan and Bethany getting paid. You know, yeah. I mean, they were in the house, right? So, yeah. But you know, when they have come forward, you know, WSU mom Kim, she's a good example. She was like treated like crap by some of these creators that interviewed her. You know, I mean, so that's right. the downside of it is when you do try to come out and speak and there's not been much of it but she would be the one example i could think of i mean i mean you'd have to be getting paid a lot of money to be able to put up with that kind of crap you know i don't know if you can hear the sirens behind me i gotta go guys i think they uh -oh. got me. Uh -oh. <laughs> i brought lucky on the show and i'm going down oh yeah, shit that'd be wild man on a live <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, well, lucky. How do we uh, how do we roll out of this when they are getting cuffed up there? Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, just make sure you get paid for whatever info you give up, so you can come bail me out. Yeah, you right. just get stu super stickers to take care of your bail. That would be there. You go. Everybody <laughs> donate, please. That's please. It. No, but uh, you know, and that's the thing. That's one reason why. I think this is a great combination of minds that have come together here. I'm very appreciative of both of you, by the way. Um, we, we think outside of the box, and I think that's very key. When you look at a case like this, you can bring in all the different angles that are truly important. We're not – none of us have come out and flat said, there's no possible way this didn't happen or this did right. happen. Because right. we don't you know, but we see the issues like this doesn't make sense. And anybody that will flow with it and say it all makes sense, you're full of whatever. <laughs> there, there's no way there's 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 just no way. And I think that it doesn't make sense for a reason. It doesn't. I think it doesn't make sense because they're hiding a lot of stuff. So right. we're only getting pieces and parts of this story. So I think but that's that why it doesn't make sense. Think of any other case in your lives that you followed or seen or researched that literally one has all the weird coincidences that this one has of so many people surrounding the house that have drug backgrounds and, you know, different histories. And then right. you've got white Elantras being found in Oregon tied back to the very house. And right. Cops making misinformed statements at the podium just to retract them back and then to go back into it again. The coincidences are just retardedly stupid. But then to watch the development of a case as we get into an arrest and working through the court hearings, and I know not every one of them is broadcast on national TV court. I get it. But this is one of the what. Here we are. We're still sitting at this very point, and major evidence is not even back yet. The right. cast report's not even back yet. That's but ridiculous. they're bickering and arguing over an alibi. Right. You are throwing a fit over an alibi, right. and you don't even have your major evidence back. Right. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, the to three me. unknown male DNAs that said they're waiting for results. Are you kidding me? They got and results I, overnight when they dug through his trash and got his dad's, you know, yeah. DNA. They they happened to just shit results overnight, but yet this, fifteen months later, still waiting on it. I mean, are you kidding me? I've never seen. I it's, have it's an eyewitness heard. that couldn't dial nine one one for eight hours, an eyewitness 
to the perp walking out of the house right. that could not pick up her phone for right. eight hours. Right. Come on. But she could call really? friends. You know, that's the thing. Really? And, and I think it's strange, too, that I think it's coming from both sides because I really think the prosecution is waiting for the alibi. And I think the defense is waiting for the information. Right. So it's one of those things where, you know, I feel like the prosecution is saying, we don't want to release this information because then they're going to form their alibi around our around information. It. Right. You know, and I think the defense is saying, we don't want to give our alibi till we know their information. Cause it's always nice when you see them coming, you know what I mean? Right. Well, Look at the shadiness of the prosecution, though, going into a discussion with the defense regarding the jury pool and the surveying of a jury. Look, guys, that happens. I've been through trials. Right. That is common. Defense attorneys do send out questionnaires and surveys. It happens all the time. Right. It's not new. Right. And now all of a sudden behind their backs, the prosecutor goes in and files a motion and it gets hammered in immediately without any type of conversation. No defense logic to battle that. It just goes into effect. Well, right. doesn't that remind you of the preliminary hearing just going out the window and bam, we got a grand jury indictment. And right. just everything is prosecution hitting you from behind. Right. Lucky if you and I got into a fist fight. The best way for me to win is to come from behind you and sucker punch you. Right. You would right. never see it coming. Even if you felt me there, I could still sucker punch you. Right. And that's what the prosecution in my mind is doing. They're sucker punching this entire case. Yeah. yeah well, and they have they have all the information. The prosecution right. has all the information already. Right. right. So, and how you know, and how it's not required that they I know that they want to play the stupid games, but how it is it not required because the taxpayers are the ones taking this one on the chin, right? That they present the evidence that they've got to the defense in an organized way so that when they get it, they're not spending six months trying to match audio with video. I mean, I never heard of anything so friggin' ridiculous I've, I've never in my whole life. Why, I mean, why, this why, is why, on the taxpayers' not? dole here. Do it, do the do us a solid and just give them the stuff organized. Then we wouldn't be here till next summer doing this. Well, honestly. the fact that they want to play games, that's what makes me believe that they have a flimsy case. Right. Yeah. They just, I mean, why not just come out and show them the information? Here's where, you know, here's where he's guilty. Right. Why not just do that? Yeah. I mean, you know, why string this along and string this along? We're really, we're 15 months in and we're no further than we were when he was arrested. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think Jen's trying to get a question in for us. Oh yeah. Guys. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say several people are asking uh if what you guys think about uh Enon Harsh, could he be some sort of a uh, of an informant? Sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> what are your thoughts on I'll that? I'll let you guys go first. I've got an astounding no, I don't believe so, and it's just very simple said he's been all over from the very beginning in public view. And I think if he was an informant, they would have shut him down immediately. Yeah, That's he inserted himself into this case. So I don't yeah. I don't think he would have done that if he was an informant. And I think it's also important for people to understand that not everybody that was around this area is involved in this crime. Right. Right. And there are people that live around this area, you know, that weren't involved in this crime at all. And I think that because Enan Harsh, you know, inserted himself into Right. The, you know, the investigation. I think that's the only reason he got any airplay at all. Yeah. Plus, he's got a criminal background. He's but an he, odd he, character. He is he's odd. I, he came off to me as more goofy than, than anything. But he did say he saw a, a black SUV in that parking lot. Or a black truck. I can't remember yeah, what but, he said. Uh, let so, me, I, and I hate to throw it this way. What? Was he high before he saw it or after he saw it? I mean, when did he spark it up and do his thing? Yeah, right. Because, I don't you know. know. I mean, there's many a times where I think I saw something too, but I've had one too many glasses of wine before right. I saw, you know, I mean, sure. come on. But, but just yeah. even the storytelling that that man has, to me, we watch out for that, those types of people when we're locked up because those are – your snitches. Those right. are the ones that give up everything 
and they don't need to. They're not even involved. They could have just stayed quiet. So I well, don't and know. When, when I watched that interview, the way he describes it, it's almost as though he's describing Kaylee's new car. Seems like and it. So I'm curious if uh. he saw that new car because it just had a drive out sticker on it. So I'm curious if he saw Kaylee's new car and didn't realize that she had gotten a new car because he would have oh. never seen that car before. True. Right. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and I, don't know if Kaylee's, I don't know if Kaylee's old car was also there because they I think they were saying that she drove a, a Ford Escape. And I, so I don't know. Didn't yeah, she sure. sell her used vehicle to help? Put the money down on the new vehicle. Oh, I, I thought I, had, I I thought I had had because I had a couple of people close to the family in my my Idaho Facebook group early, and of course right. I pissed them off with all my theories and everything I was saying. But at first they were very communicative, and it did seem as though that was one thing they had is they had a platform on social media where they sold items. Okay. Some furniture okay. pieces, clothing pieces. I remember a car being sold by one of them. Okay. For like 2500 or 3000 bucks. So, okay. I mean, I give it a little bit of credence that that's part of the down payment towards the new vehicle. I could understand it. That makes right. sense. Yeah. But it also makes sense exactly what you said. The black SUV could be hers. He right. comes driving around, sees it sitting in front of the house. Could Kaylee have gone out to just start her car to show Maddie the new car? And let me show you what it sounds like. Let me show you the radio. And well, now you're seeing a black SUV in front of the home that's not normally there. That's nice. Yeah. Well, when I was listening to him, he basically said something about like a luxury SUV. You know, yeah. he basically said it was something really, really fancy. Right. And so... Um, automatically I was thinking, well, maybe it was Kaylee's Range Rover and he had just never seen that vehicle parked in front of the house. Yeah, well, shit, You got to that, that thought quicker than I did. I was thinking of Suburban and Escalade, the Lincoln Navigate. I'm thinking of luxury. <laughs> you know, I guess Range Rovers are, are, are nice vehicles too. I know you come from kind of the backwoods fishing. I had the Land Rover. I, I mean, I know what they're about. I, I don't find them to be luxurious. I find them to be a money pit. But I had a Range Rover. I never owned another one ever in my life. Yeah, no, <laughs> definitely out of the realm of buying new parts for those. Let yeah. me tell you now. So, but great thinking. Like I, I hadn't really projected about that. That's yeah. Thought. It's a good question. Great good thought. question. Yeah. We have a, a super sticker um, asking a question from Moto again. If video and audio had to be pieced together from its original form, isn't that manipulation of evidence itself? That's a great question, actually. Yeah, I mean, the audio would be together so with the video. So, I mean, I in my editing software, I could separate the two. Yeah. And if I sent them to you as different files, you know, but you'd have to try to... would the audio even matter? I mean, I, it mattered on the, you know, when they were walking to the grub truck, but would the audio even matter of the vehicle driving around? I guess yeah, I don't know. People were talking outside, but I don't know if they Could were I, like police interviews, that. any police interviews. I know they didn't said they didn't record one with Brian, but I mean, what did they have the any audio? of the other ones, Dylan and Bethany, any of that stuff? What about the audio on the neighbor's house? They caught the thud and the dog barking, and now they're trying to align that audio with a totally different video version of the car to try to capture when what could have possibly been going on. But I still find that to be, boy, that's really hard to do because if your audio or video is off by a split second, that changes a lot of things because right. they're not adding up perfectly. So right. I know that right. you can just round about it and say, well, under the approximate time frame of 401 dash 11 seconds. Okay. Right. But we're talking but that about ca that camera though, at the corner, the one, 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 two King, that camera that we only have seen a still at one fifty six when supposedly the girls are dropped off. Um, but that camera, would sh it shows where King and Queen intersect. Right. And so anybody coming into Queen, that's the only way in and out because it's right. a one-way or right. a cul-de-sac. 
So that video, and that's a pretty good video too, quality wise. It is good quality. It's a good if, quality video camera. If they've got video from that camera, which they do because the, that's how Kaylee's sister got it, then yeah. that would show if they're claiming he was there and in his car, that would show him coming in. It would show him going out times. I mean, now you it, guys are smarter than me about this. Is that is that camera where we get that still photo? Are they able to zoom in enough to see somebody in the windshield of a vehicle, or would there actually be a light reflection off that windshield that could obscure that? I'm only asking you guys this because I have no knowledge of this. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I won't be getting busted zoom in. by video. You could zoom in on video. I mean, if there were street lights hitting the windshield, maybe you could get a glare. But I don't know. I mean, that's a really good quality video. I think if it, it's certainly going to look better than that crap picture they got at the mobile gas station leaving town. Well, so and I, I think uh, that we could have seen think that, that camera was one of those ones you screw into the light bulb. It is. That yeah. was what that security camera was. Right. So, I mean that, but that you're right. That was, that was, it was really clear. Right. Uh, you know, from that camera. So I but, think that would have been obvious. I mean, he would have had to go through there unless he parked behind the house, like they said, but I don't know. I, 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 I think it's just such a common, I think that the whole video camera stuff, I, I just don't, <laughs> I, I don't go for it. I just don't, I don't feel like they piece this together. Why does it look like he drove? so far out of his way so stupid you know it's re I, I just don't believe that and i don't believe that that video was quality enough for them to say this is our guy let's follow right him across country right i well, think it was somebody driving a white elantra there's plenty of them around molly gray had one there's all sorts of people that drove that white the area for driving yeah. a light colored, you know, for I, I, I think it's somebody bad. that made sure they were on as many cameras as possible. And then that's the one that wrecked in Eugene, Oregon. That's my official prediction yeah. on the Elantra. They claim they see was done on purpose as part. And I don't like to be black tinfoil hat, black helicopter, but I do think that that's how they set him up was to make it look like he was the one on the camera. Well, and there's, there's video manipulation. And so, um, so a story that, that a, a case that happened, uh, that where, where I live, uh, there was a, uh, there was a, it was a law enforcement had, had taken the life of a girl who, uh, was committing a, like a very misdemeanor crime. And, she was running from law enforcement and they took her life. Well, you know, the officer said that she had a weapon in her hand. And when they went back to the video, there was a weapon in her hand. Well, it came out a couple of months later when another video surfaced that there was another video very similar to that video. And there was no weapon in her hand. So, they ended up catching law enforcement using a computer software program that they're not supposed to be using. And they had actually put a weapon in her hand to cover oh, wow. for this law enforcement officer. So to me, video footage is very, especially nowadays, it, it, I, I just don't feel like it's as solid as it could be with, with you know, the way that you can manipulate it. Yeah, well, hell, if I can do it, if Tolleson. I can edit it, they can right. edit it. <laughs> right. Well, the, the guy I was talking about, Detective Tolleson from the Idaho State Police, that's what they claim he did in that Bonner's Ferry crime with Dr. Moore, where he changed the timestamp on right. the video to make it look like Dr. Moore was in the area when he wasn't. And that's how they wound up trying to get him. Thankfully, this got tossed out, and now there's a big lawsuit with, right. again from Dr. Moore involving this Tolleson, and that's why I can't believe they put him on the Idaho 4 case with all that going on in his background. So right. he's he's got experience manipulating video, so I wouldn't put it past them, really. I wouldn't. That's a good point, Lucky. When you can right. manipulate video, I mean, I mean, there's a lot you can do if you can manipulate video, especially if that's all you have. Right. 
You think know? about this too, guys. And it, it's just kind of a point of view that I have as a guy that was a criminal. And anytime I did something dishonest or I committed a crime, I got charged with it, right? Right. Shouldn't law enforcement, if it's been deemed that they've manufactured evidence, changed evidence, manipulated, manipulated the direction of an investigation, shouldn't that be criminal? Absolutely. Without Should a doubt. Someone, Absolutely. Why are they not being held accountable for manipulation, corruption, like I always was, if I right. went out and I took your debit card and I manipulated your financial being by taking money electronically from your, your credit card, right? all I've done is really what these people are being accused of doing via video or audio or whatever they're manipulating to change the outcome that affects somebody's life. That yeah. truly affects somebody's life. Yeah. So if I do that, financial, I go do five to seven years in the penitentiary. But these officers are just repositioned to investigate a whole nother crime. Right. Right. Well, no, you're that. right. They should be held civilly and criminally responsible. And if that were to happen, wouldn't this be awesome? They changed Moscow to Coburger, Idaho. <laughs> okay. And. I'm going to write, Brian's going to seek me out to write his book and I'm going to write this bestseller it's gonna and, we're be gonna a call, bestseller. and we're going to call it Coburger, Idaho. There you and go. all of those fools over there at the PDAR will be, they will be in the Latah County jail. They need to just, you go ahead and write the book. They need to bring me in as the lead investigator for Moscow. <laughs> There, we can call it a convict's way of solving crime. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody is lucky or maybe a right, little unlucky. Right. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, right. we'll introduce Lucky as a special person to come in and help me investigate. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, think about this, you guys. Well, I don't know. You know, think about this. All of the every all of the the evidence and the video stuff that they have and the still, you know, photos and all that stuff. This is all stuff that Brian Koberger would have known about. This is what criminology is about, is collecting this type of data. Right. So I just don't understand how he's going to learn. You know, he he's working on his Ph.D. in criminology, but yet he's making all these mistakes. And I mean, doesn't it? Did, I mean, it seems as though he would be aware that there were surveillance cameras right. all over, you know, all over, including especially with a cloud based forensics right. knowledge phones. He would know not to have his phone on him. Right. He would know he's going to be on every damn doorbell cam that's out there. Yeah. He knows about he phone does. pings. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's I why mean, I don't it's understand. so absurd. It is absurd it, because that is what he does. So as he's driving around this neighborhood over and over and over, it seems as, you know, because most people that are stalking a house probably aren't thinking about that type of information. But him, you know, working on his Ph.D. in criminology, it seems like that's something he would definitely be thinking about. I just right. have this feeling with Brian Koberger, man. He picks everything apart to the finest of details. I don't know why I feel that. Maybe it's because that's the way I am. Right. Like in the in the group of people that I was with, when we would plan, they would always look at me and say, "You're the one that finds the smallest of freaking details that none of us are going to pay attention to." But you're going to pinpoint that. So we're going to let you just work that part. So I would almost reference that would be Brian Koberger's part. If he was involved in a crime like this, he would know camera, 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 right. camera, audio. Don't Try take a cell phone. <laughs> you right. know, uh, that would be his part of the crime where he would be on every pinpoint knowing exactly what to look for. Now, the handling of the knife, probably not. The in and out of the home, probably not. All of those details would not be his strong suits. It's but I'll tell people. you what, he would know where the hell the cameras were. He would know why to not take a phone. He would have studied the cell phone's going to ping. They're going to have a cast report. My car's going to have a data box with movements and speeds. 
They're right. going to be able to put this stuff together all based off of the cameras. And we know yeah. every light nowadays, it's got a red or a green light that you drive through has a camera. And law enforcement uses those your cameras. Ticket. Right. Right. Yeah. He would have known yeah. about the street cams for sure, in my opinion, because yeah. law enforcement uses those cameras. Right. Yeah. And I feel like he would have known about it just feels like this is something he should have known about. Right. You know, and it, it just it's odd that he didn't consider any of this stuff. And not to mention, I think it was didn't Steve G say that his phone touched their Wi-Fi? That's what. Yeah, I remember that whole conversation he had that it actually hit their Wi-Fi. And I remember blowing up about that, how that would never be possible without the password. It's right. not possible. And I've even reached out to people that said, even when you go to a place and you do the auto connect, it doesn't always auto connect because the password could be changed. Things change. Well, and how far so, would you have had to be from that house? He would have had to be pretty close to right. that house. And I think he would have definitely known not to take his phone that close, you know, to a house right. where he's getting ready to go inside and commit a quadruple homicide. Right. Well, his phone was off, so why would it have hit the Wi-Fi anyway? I don't remember when Steve – well, because, you know, he was there 12 times. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, but without, without three TV cell phones, phone, as I understand it, without three towers at a minimum, you can't triangulate. triangulate. So all they – the best they can do is say he was in Moscow, and I don't know what, what good that's going to do. When most of the people from Pullman came to Moscow to shop and eat anyway. Right. So well, I don't know. This. He well, frequents Albertsons. He I drive, I drive between two cities. Me too. And, and I never think about it. I never even consider the fact that I'm driving to another city. Right. That's just my route. So if I'm going shopping <laughs> or going to eat somewhere in this other city. Right. I never even think that I'm crossing over into another city because that's just where I go. Exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much useless to say he was in Moscow. And then I heard if the right. tower is busy closer to him, then it would bump him to Moscow. So he could have even been in his apartment in Pullman. And doesn't the PCA say that one of those pings was from when he was yeah. not even in the town? And I'm thinking, hey. why would you put that in here? Doesn't that basically throw all this out as complete nonsense when you say one right. of them? Right. Could have was it when he wasn't even in the town. That just makes no sense. And, and I've done videos on that. I think we've all spoken about that. You discredited your own evidence by putting that one phone ping is faulty into right. your PCA. Right. Now we can look at every single ping and say, is that one faulty too, or is it not? Right. I mean, how a do you lawyer would just shred that on the stand. Yeah. Well, think well, of their timeline. That. You know, their timeline's a mess. You know, it, it, their timeline doesn't even coincide. Their so timeline's going to do them in because it's I not going to so. jive. Even just talking about the phone pings, I don't know. If you all have ever been in small towns before, a lot of times you drive to bigger towns and to grocery shop because maybe your little town doesn't have what you right. need there. So it's not uncommon for those no. towns being close together to go from one to the other just to right. get something that you may need that that town has that yours doesn't because it's a small yeah. town. I live in a town of like 3,000 people. Wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I don't have in my town. Yeah. I right. mean, it's not uncommon to travel between two cities, you know, during the course of a day. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, like I said, it only takes me maybe 12 minutes to get to, to that right. other city. That's So I don't ever even think about it because right. I can drive further in my own city. You know, so it doesn't, right. it doesn't, I think they were so close together that it seems strange that he would be around this house. Now, if he did touch that Wi-Fi, then that's a whole, you know, that's right. something totally different. Oh, yeah. But we still don't have any, you know, we don't have any yeah, information I mean, about that. If they prove that somehow he connected to their Wi-Fi. First of all, that's the connection that's necessary between the victims and Brian Coburn because right. now it's going to be a very detailed situation of how often he was in that home, how often was he on their Wi-Fi, who was he there. To, I mean, that opens a whole other door. I mean, that that's a whole widespread. But right. we're not even to the cast report or any of that being right. back yet. 
So, I mean, people need to slow down and, and really come on now, you know, well, how and people- I had someone, I had someone tell me the reason why they kept Kaylee's phone is because he actually attached to her hot spot. <laughs> I mean, come on. I've really? heard, I've heard that he was listening to the house through their, their, Google dot or whatever yeah. it is. Oh, so wow. many crazy theories yeah, out there. Yeah, I mean, and I get yeah, it. I get it. people. This is so important to solve this case to get the justice for these kids. I get that. I a hundred percent understand. I agree. Absolutely right. want justice for them. But we have to go the proper steps, and it has to really add up to one person that's going to be capitally held in a quadruple homicide is going to lose his life in all of this as well. So another family is going to lose his son on top of the four families that lost their children. I mean, this is just getting worse and worse by the minute. And, and I don't want have, to question. Well, and know. then, and then let's say, you know, they do decide to go ahead and, and, you know, and convict Brian Koberger and he's maybe not the person who did this. Well, now you've got the real people out there who did do this. Right. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is that this is a dangerous individual that's out in their community. Right. And a man sitting in, in a jail cell that was in the middle of a PhD program trying to get his life turned around. With no history and, of violence. Yeah. He stole, he stole his sister's cell phone. Uh, don't forget about that. That was right, right. <laughs> but, you know, and you got you, I mean, come you on. gotta legitimately question that too, because like I said, the leaks are very important in cases. It's very important to see leaks come out and where they lead. Right. We've had very little leaks, even about Brian Kohlberger, other than he didn't want to use the same pots and pans that had cooked meat in them before at his aunt's house. Or right. one girl at the very beginning that came out and said she drove him around not knowing he was out to score heroin, but she drove him. Did the fr- bullshit. You would know your buddy was going to get heroin. Don't lie. That's why yeah. you disappeared. You're right. off the map because you lied. Get out of here. No big right. deal. Or, hey, you've got great birthing hips. Come on. Okay. Yeah, you got paid. You know. Maybe he you wasn't know, get out of here. I've seen many girls that got great birthing <laughs> hips. Get out of here. You know, whatever. Yeah, hey, you know. That hey, that might have worked. Are, that might have worked on. Might have worked. You never know. <laughs> you never but those know. aren't even relatively important to building so a reasoning to why this kid would do this. Well, Nothing yeah. has legitimately been leaked, and I've discussed yeah. the fact of the emotional writings the kid did, where he lost touch. Maybe he didn't love his dad as much. Whatever that might. His dad flew out. They were driving back together in the car. They actually cared about each other. So don't right. tell me that all of a sudden he doesn't care about his dad. They're driving home together for the holidays. Get the hell out of here. You know? Well, and right. the age gap. The age gap is something that's always that I've always kept in mind. He was 28 years old. 28 year olds right. aren't hanging out with you know, I mean, it seems it would be odd that he would be hanging out with 20 year olds. And right. 21 year olds, you know, I mean, it doesn't sound like a big age gap when you get to my age, but when you're, when you're 20, yeah, that's an a eight big year age gap is a lot. So it doesn't right. seem as though Brian Koberger would be hanging out with this crowd, especially really as intelligent like as he was. I would think right. he would have a hard time with the party, you know, girl type mentality oh, thing going well, on. Wasn't he just legitimately trying to get his PhD? I mean, I, I really feel like he doesn't have time for all this crap. Right. You know? It's pretty right. I mean, it's one thing to say, and everybody excuse me for saying this, we go out to get laid for about 45 minutes on a Friday night. Right. Okay, I can see it. But I'm so enthralled with this young lady that now I'm devastated that she won't go on a second date with me. So I go take four people's lives. Come right. On. Well, and I've talked I've talked to a few people that know Brian Koberger. And I've asked them straight away. That was one of the questions I asked is, you know, about his social life. And nobody, nobody ever said he was a party animal or that he was right. all about the party. <laughs> You know, because right. I, I don't believe that's the case. I don't no. you know. I, I mean, I think he had a narcotics problem 10, you know, eight years earlier. But I, you know, I just I feel they said it was H, obviously, but you don't meet you don't meet very many productive 
you know, H at it. Right. You right. just don't. They're not working on PhDs and they're definitely not applying Teaching. to work for law enforcement. Right. That's it true. Well, let me it, tell you, it doesn't happen. Uh, H is the number one used narcotic in the penitentiaries. It's number right. one. It's the easiest right. to get in. It's the easiest to use. There's many ways of using it. But the whole thing, just what you said, the actual productive H users, very rare. There's very a few rare. that can very, there are a few. Very rare. Let me tell you, I loved it when I had people on my run or in my cell that were an H user because they passed the F out and they slept all day. Right. The only time I ever saw them is when they had to get up, go to the bathroom, and they went and they laid back down, went to sleep. And right. it was like, you know, you have to keep life real. So I would legitimately buy a little more to push their way so that they could sleep for the next three or four days. It's like, if yeah. you're going to be at my cell, it's my rules here, mm -hmm. go to sleep. They were well, not up. Say, they, uh, yeah. Law enforcement, you know, they said they found a green leafy substance. So people automatically were like, Oh, they found a green leafy substance. And I'm like, let's not compare the green leafy substance to the H because right. they're two totally different users. I mean, right. they might use the same, you know, you might have, and an it's H legal in Washington. It was legal. So, I mean, you know, I think it's like legal in, I think, I think it's legal in like a third of the States now. Right. Yeah. It's like drinking a beer to me. Right. I think it's ridiculous. Right. But I just don't, I don't feel like here, you can compare the two. Here right. in Vegas, it's not legal unless you go into one of their actual sanctioned areas and pay them to be able to smoke it. You know what I mean? Oh, if wow. you go out on the strip, you can go to jail for it. You don't, but you yeah, could. People right? still do it all day long. But if you go to the marijuana yeah. smoking bars regulated by the state, you're good. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, they're going to figure yeah. out a way to tax it. You know, they're going to figure out a way to right. be money on it. That's for right. sure. But that's the thing. Like when we look at Brian Colbert or people start saying, well, he's an H addict. That is completely different. And I've been around all of them. When you're incarcerated, you're around all of them. You know yeah. what, who's on what, you know, who's on an upper, you know, who's on an opiate, you know, mm -hmm. who's smoking spice is big over here. You got H white China. You got them all. They're yeah. all right there. I mean, the inside the penitentiary, you get more of it than you do on the streets. It's all there. Yeah. But you see the personalities of everybody. And look, I happen to be housed with some of the real actual big boys. These were the big boys. They were bigger right. than me, for sure. Definitely more intimidating than I could ever come across as. You didn't find many of them using H. No. You found them on uppers. And you found them on like pills, and anything to get the blood to flowing, to flowing within them. They were not on downers. Uh, and when they were on downers, they were out for like a month sleeping and calm and collected. And that's what he actually wanted to hit them up for a honey bun or a top right. and find out about because they were so mellow that they couldn't do anything. So I get I, everybody I, reacts differently. I do. But I've been around the criminal mind with the addiction and the narcotics and I've seen the interaction of it. So well, I wonder if he was uh, drug tested when he was arrested. You're not allowed That'd be to be a good question. You're really? not allowed, not allowed to be. really uh -huh. unless you're on a drug violation or a drug charge. Uh huh. huh. They can't even ask you to do it. Huh. Wow. They can't even request it. Okay. Interesting. I've only learned that through experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I've right. Only it through experience. <laughs> I was going to ask a question real quick from Dark Angel. She says, "Is it really possible for one person to do this crime by themselves and not get any DNA in the car, office, or home?" Ironic. It's only touch DNA found if it was such a bloody crime scene. That's a really good question. Do you want me? I I, I mean. I, I don't think it's possible. I don't think I think it is possible for one person to do this type of crime, but I don't believe it's somebody. I don't believe it's Brian Coburg or I don't believe it's a this is a different type of individual. I think this I don't believe that this is a scholar that committed these crimes. No, the second and part I, of that question is one person doing it without getting any DNA anywhere. Right. I, I mean, I guess. It, I, I mean, I think anything's possible. If they came prepared with a change of clothes, I mean, in the Army, we used to 
take baths with baby wipes, you know, out in the field. So if a person came prepared and took all their dirty stuff with them, they could have done it, but I don't think they could have done it in nine minutes. Not all that. They would have needed more time. That's that's absurd. That's absurd. I think the the way to dissect that question, to answer that the best way is, could one person stab somebody and kill four people with a knife? Yes. Yes. Could they do it in a short period of time? Yes. Could they do it with all the additional factors that this case brings into play? Now you start getting into some really crazy types of the the short time frame, the no blood found in the car. There's no way you go commit this crime. And again, I can only rely on what I know from my experiences. That's all I can do. And I've been around people that have done horrendous crimes, maybe not to this extreme, but they've taken people's lives in a very graphic way. And it, within the experience, it's the mentality that you have to, one, be able to commit that crime, to right. the emotional right. capability to accept that you're committing this crime. Because most, if I come over to you, Lucky, and I just stab you, depending right. on my mindset is how I'm going to emotionally take that. Right. If I am in a gripping, really upset manner, I can stab you, but later I'm going to feel bad about what I've done, and emotionally I won't handle it as well. Right. We're right. still watching this kid sit before everybody where they've stated he took four lives of college kids, and now we're a year and a half later. You don't see an ounce of emotion in any way that he regrets anything. You don't see anything like where he's stumbling backwards when he speaks like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. I got butt. There's no emotion to the effect of what someone that commits a crime like this, a normal person, would feel. Now, if I'm that type of person that just don't care, I'm one of the serial killer breeds or the people that can take advantage of children or somebody that is willing and capable of diving into this type of crime. You would not be trying to become law enforcement with a PhD education to solve crime if you're one that wants to commit it. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, and you have to think about this. Think about you have your suspect, but you still have your victims. So unless those victims were just laying still, just kind of waiting their turn. Right. It it seems odd that that because one person wouldn't have been able to contain four people. No. So I don't understand how it because the way they make it sound, they make it sound like he just went from one person to another to another to another. As if it was easy. As right. If it like, was it, like as if they were just not moving. Right. You know, why wasn't anybody moving around? That's what I don't understand. And I actually think it was Christy Gonzalez that said in an interview, like it, it's odd that 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 they took him one at a time. Right. You know, in succession. And that that's strange that nobody was moving around. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you guys have been around. Have you been in a bar fight before where it's you against a couple other people? Yeah. And you mm-hmm. just start swinging for the heavens? Well, I mean, that's obviously a very different scenario because everybody's close proximity to you right here. And think about the hell and the chaos of fighting those people off. Well, now you got to go up and live. Yeah, now you got to go up and down stairs and you got to handle a blade in your hand. Trust me, holding a blade in your hand in a crime like this, that thing's flying out of your hand. It's sliding in your hand. It's turning right. back. You're hitting yourself. You're hitting the wall. You. And then once, I, I, I mean, I your hand's that close. So you're getting body fluid all over your hand, all over the weapon. And right. you've got two, you've got two roommates in the house still. You got one on the ground floor. You right. don't know what happened to her. She could have driven off a long time ago. Right. You right. know, you don't know what's happening to her because you have no containment. There's no containment for this suspect. Right. Well, and at the end of the day, where was Hunter Johnson? I just have a feeling he was in the home. I just have a feeling he was there somewhere. He's well, always possible. There. He, he never he left. Never right. He might have been in that sixth bedroom. Who the hell knows? That's that's true as well. Is he the informant? Is he the witness? He's the first one that they called on scene. 
He, and the front door was that, left open at eight o'clock in the morning. Did he go running out of the house saying, "Holy shit! Holy shit! So I want out of this." Maybe that's why they don't release that nine one one because they know he's on there, and if he's their informant, maybe he told them on the phone something about Brian, and that's right. why they don't want to release it because he's the he's the informant they're protecting. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe the girlfriend's there this. with him. You know, I'm curious. Maybe his but, girlfriend was there. But what time did he get there in the morning? What time did they yeah, call people over in the morning? Because regardless of who went there and who was there, 911 was not called until noon. So right. what time did all these friends arrive? And how do you get all of these people not to call law enforcement? Because it seems like right. at some point they would be wondering, where's law enforcement? Where's the right. first responders? Right. Why, well, why the Snapchats and stuff were going out at like eight eight thirty. I thought so. That's what they said. So that's why don't we hear more about the front door being propped open by a walking neighbor that saw the door? Were they airing out? Did somebody already get to the scene? They've already been called over, and they had said, "Holy shit, it stinks so bad in here." I'm gonna yeah. open the door. That's why I think the doors were open. In the house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, you know, that's the whole odd part about these crimes is that these two, sur or I don't want to say surviving, these two roommates that were in the house, that, that, that was the first thing that caught my attention about this case. And I just think that, you know, I think they have the answers. I think they have the answers, you know, to what happened. Yeah. Well, I know one answer I have is if the three of us right here were the surviving roommates in that house and didn't dial 911 for eight hours, all three of us would be sitting in jail with Brian yep. Goldberger right now. Without yeah, a doubt. Be trying to figure out what Without a doubt. Was. Without a doubt. Yeah. That's hey, just my opinion. AR, I want to uh, make sure I get these uh, prizes given out here before we uh, part ways. I know we're getting close, so I just wanted to yeah, mention Yeah, let's that. do it. Let's do All it. All right. It's All right. So, so here we go. The first contest to win this sweet Murder Metal Mayhem t-shirt, and you'll be like the coolest person on the block with that, baby. And you get a die-cut sticker, and all you got to do is email – Murder metal mayhem at gmail.com with the answer to this question. Who is that over my shoulder? That clown up there. I'll give you a hint. He's from Chicago. He's a serial killer. So you got that hint. That's an easy one. You got to do this by midnight. Yes. <laughs> Central, Central Standard Time. Email murder metal mayhem at gmail. The answer to that question. And then the second question. Uh, prize a different question will be for my book deeper than dead this is a novel it's illustrated so it's it's pretty cool i think you'll dig it if you like horror uh thrillers and stuff like that so the second question is who is the uh the serial killer on my other shoulder wow i'm all confused here because it's in the reverse <laughs> over my other shoulder this one may be a little bit harder to recognize but he was an attorney or an aspiring attorney. I'll give you that hint. There's been quite a few docu-series about him. But he went on a little cross-country rampage and ended up in Florida at a sorority house. And he murdered quite a few people in a short span of time. So it does happen. But uh, there's your two questions. You email me at Murder Metal Mayhem. You can only give me one answer per person and put your country in the email so I know where you're from. And I'll use a random number generator to pick the winner. You got to have that in by midnight central time. So a few hours from now. So, I just guessed Michael go. Myers. Yeah, yeah, I win. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're pissed off because you don't even have shirts of my size. When you get to yeah. the extra small large large and awesome. extra large is all I'm in, but I'm I'm getting new shirts, AR. I promise I'll get you one. <laughs> so I, I actually uh, my little giveaway like yours is I'm going to answer a question that many people actually have put within the comments on many of my videos asking me about my nose piercings why in the hell <laughs> would I pierce my nose just like this it's to piss people off <laughs> it really is I grew up in a very uh uh God, I can't even think of the word. 
military strict. based family that the very first time I came home, I got my ear pierced and my dad ripped it out of my ear at full force and said, you will never do this again. And I looked right at him and I said, you want to make a bet? So the next day I came back and I had my other ear pierced. This one's still bleeding. I said, I told you. And he ripped that one out. Oh, damn. So as I got older, I said, all right, well, now we're going to put in some permanent piercings in the old nose. And I dare anybody to even try to take these out. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't. But want that's to a little humor, April Fool. No, I'm that's kidding. <laughs> yeah, what a rebel! I just like defaced myself to make myself uglier than I started at. <laughs> but you know, it's fun that way, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, we definitely had some fun tonight. The good conversation between the three of us—that's for sure. Yeah, it's a pleasure, appreciate guys. appreciate Jen, uh, your wife, uh, helping out, and my lovely wife Jennifer. Uh, yeah. doing some moderator work behind the scenes, so we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know, much. I, I truly, sure, it's a blessing to work with both of you guys in, in the difficulty of the platform that we work within. I mean, we we see it everywhere. The toll that this type of community takes mentally, emotionally, because we work hard on cases, we work hard on research. These right. are emotional things. We have victims. We have things that happen. I'm right. never saying that the drama is a legitimate thing that people need to get into, but I get a little bit of an understanding for where people get out of whack with each other. But you guys are amazing stand-up people. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with you. I want to say that. It's a privilege. I Lucky you and I behind the scenes have had a good time. Pete, yeah. you and I have had a great time. I consider both of you guys friends. Yeah, and I look I forward agree. to being able to do a few more things here or there with you guys. But we all do focus on our own work as well. And I appreciate you guys' hard work. I definitely am a fan and I'm a follower and a supporter. So, Willow wants man. to do a, sh a tattoo showdown. A tattoo showdown. Uh, What's that? Uh, I said Willow's wants you guys to do a tattoo uh, showdown. Yeah. Uh oh, man. <laughs> that could get very interesting, right? Well, I, I have think met, I, I I've think met I quite a her, few. I think I told her I would show her my hands in my in 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 my last video, and I don't remember well, if I ever did that actually. Now that you know, if we sit here lucky and went tattoo for tattoo, we might be here a while. It could take a minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I let's not do that on a live, guys. Yeah, my wife doesn't even want. I, we may have to expose some body parts that yeah. don't. Need to be yeah, we don't need that AR. We don't need that. Um, I'm covered. So, I mean, it, it's not even a, a worthy battle because you've got what means many things to you, the importance of yours that stand out to you, and I got mine. So, right, that's right. I right. respect and love to you guys for yours, but I'm not showing mine off. My great physique. <laughs> right. Um, that wears an extra, extra small shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, guys, it's been a blast. I hope we get to do it again soon. And Me too. You know, I, I always try to keep it at a good time for you guys and for us. And yeah, enjoy your night. I love the community. Lucky, why don't you send us off and Pete, you as well? I'm done talking. Just really quick, though, I did want to say thank you everybody for being in here with us this live. I'm sorry if I didn't get to answer all your questions. It's kind of a discussion, so we can't always get in all the questions, but we definitely appreciate each and every one of you all being here. And with that, go ahead, uh, <laughs> Pete and Lucky. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, we appreciate it very much. You could see the camaraderie here. It's legit. It's real. And I thoroughly enjoyed this and appreciate everybody that checked it out. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to everybody and AR and, and Pete. I really appreciate you guys inviting me on. I had a lot of fun. You know, this was my first live. I know. I've, awesome. I, I, I've never done a live before. So uh, I pre I I'm, glad I, got, to, I'm glad I got to do it with you guys. Yeah, I, I was just my it. second. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad Very I got cool. to do it with you guys. Excellent. You guys are awesome. We'll do it again. I, I truly appreciate both of you. And, uh, Behind the scenes, let's get together, do some more videos and some back and forth between videos. 
let's give the, the subscribers exactly what they deserve. And that's great work between all three of us. Absolutely. We'll and everybody um, that's asking how you know if you win Pete's stuff is you email him before midnight and he will randomly select a winner that has the correct answer to his yeah, question. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, I'll do the random number generator. I'll email everybody, let them all know whether you're right or wrong, and then who's the winner. So you'll know and Just tomorrow. know, we're as corrupt as the Moscow Police Department, so it's already <laughs> in the bag. We already have a winner. <laughs> but please email us so we can put you on our speed dialer and spam right. you. For the yeah, speed. right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate you, and we'll we'll talk again very soon. I appreciate right, it. See you. Have a good night. Have a great night.